So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Franck Wielonski. He's from France, University, University of uh, Aix-Marseille. Uh, and uh, he will be talking about uh, race energy problems in unbounded sets of uh, RD. Okay, just tell me when I need to change the slide. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe you can put it in, in full screen or? I think it's full screen. It's full screen, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, so sorry for for the for the problem. So first of all, I, I would like to 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 thank the organizers for 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 the organizing the conference and also for the invitation. And uh, yeah, so uh, I I I will talk about um, a, a joint work with uh, uh, Peter Dragnev, uh, Ramon Oriv, uh, Oriv and um, Ed Saf. And uh, it will be about uh, risk energy problems in uh, RD. And so uh, I will first start with uh, a few uh, definition. And uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so you, you can see the, the risk potential theory as a counterpart to, to the logarithmic theory, which takes place in the plane. So maybe you are more used with uh, the logarithmic theory, but uh, the risk uh, potential theory has many uh, similarities with, uh, with the logarithmic case. And uh, okay, so uh, first of all, you, you need to define potentials. And uh, you, you, you see my cursor? No, oh, no you, you do not see my cursor, yeah. Oh, I sorry. My cursor. <laughs> yeah, sorry for that, yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah, so you have um, um, uh, this uh, definition of a potential. So you consider a measure and you divide by a kernel, which is um, a power of uh, the difference between uh, this two point X and T. And uh, you can choose an exponent S, which will be between zero and D. And uh, I guess you know that when S is equal to D minus two, this is a very classical case, which is a Newton case. Uh, okay, so um, as usual, we will be interested in uh, the problem of uh, minimizing the energy of a measure. And so uh, you have the definition of the, um, of the energy of a measure. And here uh, it's the weighted version of the energy. So you have a, a, a weight Q. Uh, which is uh, assumed to be a lower semi-continuous weight. And the problem takes place usually in a compact set K of the Euclidean space RD. And so the problem is to find an, a measure which minimizes this energy. Uh, okay, so uh, you have this uh, usual properties that uh, such a measure satisfies uh, variational conditions. And these are these two inequalities, which are usually, they are called the Frostman inequalities. And uh, they give some condition on, uh, on K and uh, another condition on the support of the measure. Okay, and when there is no weight, uh, when just uh, speak about the equilibrium measure uh, of the compact set K. Okay, so when K is a compact nonpolar set, there is always a solution which is unique and which gives you the, the one with a minimal energy. Okay, so then you, you, you may ask the same problem with an unbounded set. So you replace a compact set with a, something unbounded. And you, you can study this problem and asking if there will be a solution. 
And the fact uh, that there is a solution or, or no solution uh, depends on Q on the weight. And so uh, the problem is to find optimal conditions on this weight. So uh, let's say minimal condition on Q so uh, that you can assert that there will be a minimizing measure. And this is the problem that I would uh, describe in the next slides. Okay, so I will come uh, to this problem uh, very soon, but uh, before I would uh, recall a few definitions. So where are you? Thank you. So I will say a few facts about um, the rich potential theory. And I guess that it started uh, with a, a long paper by uh, Marcel Ries in, uh, from 38, where he studies these kind of potentials. And the paper is, uh, contains a lot of properties about these kind of potentials. And uh, so here, yeah, uh, I should also say that sometimes S is replaced with a D minus alpha, so alpha is a complement of S. So sometimes uh, people use S and sometimes they use alpha. So it's, the relation is just that one S is equal to D minus alpha. And uh, I should say that uh, in the Newtonian case, uh, the, the theory is related to an operator, which is a Laplacian. And it's related in the sense that uh, the Laplacian uh, inverses, inverses the potential. So here is that relation that when you apply the Laplacian to the potential, you recover the measure up to some constant. And uh, actually you have the same uh, type of uh, relation for risk potentials, but this time you have to change uh, the operator. You have to consider the fractional Laplacian and here, yeah, you see the definition of this fractional Laplacian. Actually, there are many different uh, way, ways to define the fractional Laplacian. So here, that's just one way to define it. But uh, the main difference with the usual Laplacian is that the, the first one is a local operator. And the second one is a non-local operator. So what I mean by local operator, I mean that in order to compute the Laplacian of some function, you just need to know the function in a neighborhood of the point where you want to compute the Laplacian. But this is not so for the fractional Laplacian. And you can see this from, from the definition. You have an integral and you need to compute the integral on the whole complement of the point X, okay? So that means that you need to know U everywhere in order to compute this uh, uh, lap, uh, fractional Laplacian. So that makes a difference between uh, the usual theory and the Ries theory. And this difference will uh, again show up later in the, in the talk. Okay, but uh, again, you have the same kind of uh, relation that uh, if you apply this fractional Laplacian to the, here I just uh, took a, a Dirac mass, you, um, you know, I mean, if you, if you apply this fractional Laplacian to the kernel, you, you get the Dirac measure at zero. So that's the analog of the first relation. Okay, so then, uh, okay, so that we, we may go to the next slide. And uh, I would also say that there are uh, um, two uh, classes of, uh, of exponents. The first one, when S is be, uh, between D and D minus two. And uh, in that case, you have many, many properties from the logarithmic case. So let me just recall these properties. You have the principle of maximum on the third part. You have a domination principle. Uh, the potential this time are no more superharmonic, but there is an, an analog uh, uh, property which is called alpha superharmonicity, 
which was introduced by Ruiz himself. Uh, okay. And also you have uh, the balayage, the notion of balayage. And uh, here I should say that uh, there is some differences with uh, the logarithm case, because if uh, you have a measure which is outside of some set F and you want to consider the balayage of that measure onto F, what you get is a new measure uh, whose support is not only supported on the boundary of F, but it's uh, supported on the whole set F. So also that makes a, a, a small difference with the logarithmic case. And the second difference is that the mass of the measure is not, uh, is not preserved when you do this balayage. So it, it decreases, okay? So that makes uh, two differences with uh, the balayage in the logarithmic case. Okay, and then just let me say that then in the case of, um, yeah, I, I suppose that you know what is the, the balayage, the property of the balayage. So I, I will yeah, I just keep this <laughs> blue line. And uh, let me just say that when S is smaller than D minus two, uh, the most part of the uh, properties are lost. Uh, the only one which, which, which is satisfied is that the potential are subharmonic, okay? So it, this difference makes uh, uh, makes that uh, usually the first case is 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 more studied than the second one, and also here uh, we will get more prop, uh, prop, uh, properties for the first case. Okay, so maybe we can uh, go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. So. Um, uh, here I will give uh, I will go back to to the problem about uh, finding a good assumption on on the external field so that there is a solution to the minimization problem. So let me say that usually uh, one uh, assumes that Q, the external field, grows to infinity as X goes to infinity, and this is this kind of assumption that we would like to improve. And uh, this is what is uh, below. So actually we will only assume that the external field has a limit at infinity, which, could, which can be any number be between minus infinity and infinity. And there is also a slight uh, extra condition that we need to, to assume that the point at infinity is a non sin point of the of the set, okay. So this is a little bit technical, but the, okay. So the, the, the main assumption is that Q is a limit, and so if you assume this, we have uh, uh, several conditions which ensures ensures uh, either existence or non existence. So the first one, which gives a sufficient condition for the existence of a, a minimizing measure is this inequality. So it tells that Q should go to, to its limit in, in a specific way. It should stay below this difference that you see. So the limit minus one over X to the S. So this inequality, if it is satisfied in a neighborhood of infinity, then you can assert that uh, a minimizing measure exists, okay? So that's a condition. And uh, there is a kind of uh, reciprocal to that, which is uh, the item two, which says that a sufficient condition for non-existence of a measure now is that um, the conver uh, a kind of converse to the previous inequality satisfied in that sense that Q now should be uh, bigger than the difference on the, on the left. And here C now is um, a smaller than one. So that means that this uh, difference is bigger than the previous one, okay? 
So now Q should be bigger than this quantity. And uh, okay, so also there is a small difference which comes from the proof that this inequality this time should be satisfied everywhere on sigma, not only uh, for large X, but everywhere. Okay. Uh, and the last uh, statement, which gives a condition for uh, the fact that the support is unbounded when, when the measure exists. And this is a condition which is in some sense between the two previous one, because now you see, you need that uh, actually the limb, the limb inf of this product is exactly equal to minus one. So you see, you get something which is in between the two, the two previous uh, conditions. Okay. And this is a necessary condition. Okay. So that's uh, the main, uh, the main uh, result about uh, existence or non-existence of a measure. And you see, this is a condition which is uh, weaker than the, the first one. Okay. So maybe next we, we can go for an example. So I, I will just uh, take an easy example, which is uh, the following one. You have a set which does not contain the origin and you take an external field, uh, which is just uh, a charge, a negative charge at the origin. And uh, of course, in that case, the limit of the external field at the infinity is zero and you can apply the theorem and it will say it will uh, say that when the constant c is larger than one, a minimizing measure exists. Uh, and if it's uh, uh, larger or equal, and if it is larger, then the minimizing measure has a bounded support. And uh, uh, the last uh, case, when c is smaller than one then you can assert that there is no minimizing measure. So you see this condition on, on C, it's related to the strength of the charge that you have put at the origin. So if you have a big negative charge, of course there will be a measure and a minimizing measure. But if the, the charge because, becomes smaller than one, then uh, uh, you, you have no solution, okay? Yeah. So that's an easy example. Okay, so we can uh, skip, uh, go to the next one. And uh, here I, I just would like uh, to give an idea of the proof just in one slide. And what is the idea of the proof? So uh, it, it's not very original, but we are going to consider a Kelvin transform from the uh, wool space RD to the sphere of dimensional D, of dimension D uh, in R, R D plus one. Uh, so that's the image of the space is the whole space, uh, the whole sphere. And so that the point at infinity goes to the North pole of the sphere. So if you uh, consider this transform, you have a relation between measure on R D and measure on the sphere, which are given by the inequality, which I, I have, yeah, which is written there. And you see the right hand side, you, you can rewrite this right hand side as a potential. So if you assume that the measure on RD as mass one, the condition becomes a condition on the potential of the, of the image of you, mu, okay? So that means that you change the normalization. The, on, on, on the left, you have a normalization by the mass. On the right, you have a normalization by the potential, by the value of the potential at the infinity, okay? So there is a special case when S equal to zero, which is a logarithm case. And you see the formula when s equals zero, uh, let's, uh, you, you, you still get the same mass. So in some sense, in that case, the problem is easier because you keep the same normalization. And uh, then you can uh, 
translate the, the, the problems. And uh, you, you see that the new external field on the sphere is just given by Q of T minus log of T. You, yeah, yeah. And now on the sphere, the only condition for having an um, equilibrium measure is that this external field is a lower semi, semi continuous function. And so if you translate this single condition on Q, you see, you get this condition at infinity. And this condition, in some sense, it's a sh sharp condition for Q in order that you have a, um, a, a solution to the minimization problem, okay? So it, it tells that it should grow like a logarithmic uh, function, okay? But now when uh, you go to the risk case, uh, the equivalence between the two problems is not so easy because the normalization is changed and also the Frostman inequalities are not exactly similar. They are uh, changed. So a way to solve the problem is to proceed by approximation. So what you do is you consider the same problem, but we, you remove on the left a neighborhood of infinity and you remove on the right a neighborhood of the origin, uh, sorry, of the North Pole, okay? So in this way, you, you, you get again um, a compact setting on, the, on, the, on, on both sides, actually. And on the left, you know that there is a measure which solves the, the, the problem. So you get by uh, letting n go to infinity, a sequence of measure which solves the problem on the, on the left. But on the left, you cannot take a subsequence because the supports are, are not bounded. So you, you, you can take a subsequence on the right because on the right, you have a compact set. So you do this on the right, you take a subsequence, which has a limit. And the last thing to do is to check that this limit uh, satisfies the Frostman inequalities that you need in order to, to state that you have found your solution to the minimization problem. So uh, checking that mu star satisfies these Hotzman inequalities is the main uh, um, work that you have to do to, to achieve the proof, okay? And when you do this, yeah, you, just the last thing, when you do this, this is where these conditions that I, I stated before appear. Yeah, you, you see that you need these conditions if you want to show that mu star satisfies these Hotzman inequalities. Okay, yeah. Okay, so thank you. You, you, Walter, you can go to the next one. Okay, so um, I think uh, your time is almost up now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so I, I, I wanted to give another example, maybe uh, not uh, less trivial than the first one, and uh, this example. Uh, in this example, you consider a charge which is above Rd. So you put a, a negative charge at this point Y, which is above the origin and with at some uh, height uh, Yd plus one. And uh, then you get uh, an external fit Q, which is given by this formula. It's easy to, to check that. And uh, in that case, you can uh, compute everything. So actually you can check that uh, the support of the minimizing measure will be a closed ball. And the ball is given by some formula where you need to solve the equation which is below. And uh, maybe you, you can expect that uh, in the risk case, the kind of, of functions which appears are the hypergeometric uh, functions. So indeed, in that case, you need to solve an equation with a, an hypergeometric uh, function, 
to compute the radius. Okay. And uh, below I have shown uh, some density. You can compute the density. So in two cases. So of course, if the, if the charge uh, comes uh, uh, near the plane, the hypersurface, uh, the density grow at the origin. And uh, so that uh, you, have, you have these two cases with um, when you take uh, different values of uh, that uh, coordinate uh, y d plus one. Okay, so maybe I, I, I will say a word about uh, how do you get, uh, uh, what you need to do to, to compute this uh, solution. So maybe we can go to the next uh, slide. Is there a next slide? Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So how, 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 how you do to compute the equilibrium measure? So we, we use uh, the sine equilibrium measure, uh, which uh, was already the subject of a previous talk. And uh, so I just remind that uh, uh, it's characterized by the fact that the potential plus Q is constant on the set sigma. Uh, it has mass one. But uh, the main thing is that we relax uh, the hypothesis that it must be a positive measure. So now it can be a sign measure. And the fact that you uh, relax that condition, it makes uh, the, uh, the, um, the computation for, for that measure easier, of course, because you, you lose a, a constraint on the measure. And uh, especially when Q is a, itself a potential, it's quite easy to find uh, the sign equilibrium measure by using a balayage. And there is another property which is uh, quite important here, which is, uh, yeah, the blue one above. Yeah, that one, thing, which, uh, which is that the support of the equilibrium measure in, is included in the positive part of the support of the signed equilibrium measure. And this plays a role in, in, that, in that problem. Okay, so now to, to compute the, the equilibrium measure, you, you do uh, several steps. So uh, first of all, uh, you, the charge was uh, smaller than minus one. So that means that uh, the support will be compact. And by, by the symmetry of the problem, the outer boundary of the support is a sphere. And then uh, what you do is that uh, first you compute the balayage of the mass of the charge to the whole space RD. And this you can do via some Kelvin transform. And then you compute the balayage onto some, um, uh, some ball of uh, a given radius R. And this you can also do because actually you, you, there is a formula for the Poisson kernel of the ball. And uh, using that formula, you, you can compute the balayage. And then uh, you, you, have, you have this formula for the sign equilibrium measure. So you have two terms. So the first terms uh, is there to complement the external field. And the second term is to make the mass equal to one. So in the second term, you have uh, this omega r, which is uh, omega, omega r is um, the, the equilibrium measure of the ball. And uh, uh, the other um, uh, quantity mr, this is uh, the new mass that you get when you do the balayage because as I said before, when you do a, a balayage, you, you lose some mass. So here you, you need to take this into account in the formula. Okay. So now, now you have the, the expression of the, of the balayage of the sine equilibrium measure. And you, you look to, to its density on the, on the sphere of radius R. And you can show that this density, when the radius is very small, is going to infinity. And when the radius is going to infinity, 
the density is going to zero by negative values. So that means that there is some value R for which the density is going to vanish. And this is exactly what you do. You pick this special, at least one of these values, you, you pick the largest one, and then you can check that the sign equilibrium measure actually here is positive, okay? And so that means by, by some uh, statement that in that case, you, you just found the equilibrium measure of your problem. So you see, at the same time, you, you found the radius and the density of the, uh, of the equilibrium measure, okay? Okay, so... Uh, no, I, I, I wanted to, to go to the second part of the, of the talk, but I, I don't know. Oh, you, you, I can do that or? No, oh, your time is over, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, so I will stop here. Okay. So thanks uh, for this talk uh, with a little bit of delay. Uh, so are there any questions? I can't see now because I'm sharing the screen. Okay. okay. Uh, maybe I have one. Yes, Bernd. Bernd. Yeah. Uh, Bernd um, the first example which you showed us, you also, in fact, it allows us to, to understand balayage, no? For these potentials. Because you had an ex, um, right hand side, which was in fact, yeah, yeah, the balayage sure. on sigma. No? Yeah, you, you, can, you could also answer the question by considering a balayage, yes, sure. Yeah. That's what you compute now with your external field. In in the in this in the second case, yeah? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful talk. Thanks. Sorry, sorry for the for the problem. Oh, that's okay. We solved the problem. <laughs> we missed only seven minutes. We had a delay of seven minutes. So uh, I guess we stop here and thank uh, Frank uh, once more. And then uh, you can have a coffee break uh, in Sochi uh, or in your own place. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.